There's something beautiful about magic, and that its entertainment comes from not knowing. It's a pretty rare thing these days to have no idea how something works. When I first moved to New York, its idiosyncrasies were sometimes confusing, but now I pretty much get it. That's a bunch of LED lights programmed by a simple computer to try to sell me something. That's condensation from rain turning to steam from some hot pipes. That's a local rat just trying to feed its family. And that I, uh, I actually don't know what that is, but I'm okay with that. But with magic, you don't get it. And whether you're a child seeing a trick for the first time or a grown adult who got an A minus in college physics, it's still incredibly exciting to be deceived in a spectacular way. That's the heart of magic. And humans have been experiencing this spectacular deception for thousands of years. Hi, I'm Justin Dodd and fine, it was a B plus. And this is the history of fun, an exploration of the origins of humans having a good time. Today we're looking at magic, from ancient street performers to Houdini to the internet age of illusion. I'll be breaking down the history of this art form with a little help from my buddy, Gustav Kuhn, an expert in the science of magic from the Department of Psychology at Goldsmiths University of London, in an attempt to pinpoint what it is about experiencing the impossible that's so incredibly magically fun. Let's get started. Now let me just make something clear from the get-go. Today, I'm gonna to be discussing the art and entertainment of magic, Allusions to entertain folks. Stage magic, magic shops, David Copperfield, that kind of stuff. I'm not gonna be talking about the history of magic, the spiritual practice of tapping into the divine arts to affect mortal planes, alchemy, sorcery, necromancy. While that kind of magic is interesting, I don't know if it necessarily always falls under the fun category, you know, especially when supposedly practicing said magic led to, oh, I don't know, innocent women being burned alive. So, uh, back to the fun kind of magic. Some claim that the first recorded instance of the art of illusion dates back over 4,000 years to ancient Egypt. On the interior walls of a ritual chamber from around 2000 BCE, an image depicts two men seemingly performing a magic trick. And, you might be surprised to learn, it looks an awful lot like a trick that is still performed to this day. You've probably seen it in person yourself. It's the old cup and balls routine. You know, the one where objects are placed under cups or shells and appear to switch locations, vanish, and reappear at will. Well, there you have it, the oldest trick in the book, or the wall. But most experts aren't convinced that's actually what the image is depicting. Historian Bill Palmer points to a couple pieces of evidence. For one, the cup and balls routine has basically never involved two people performing the trick simultaneously. Also, there are no balls in the picture, just cups. And the nearby images are mostly like people making food for a feast. So these two guys might not be performing illusions with cups, they might be bread makers. And while cooking delicious food is magical, it's not exactly what we're looking for. We do have a confirmed account of the cup and ball trick that dates back to the first century CE. And as far as I'm concerned, any year that only has two digits in it is still as old as heck. This one was being performed by ancient Romans. But even as that trick entertained folks for the next several centuries, it wasn't all fun and games. In fact, for years, the cup and balls, among other street side sleight of hand performances, was associated with cons and gambling. If the performer is skilled enough and a little wager is added to the mix, you can swindle basically anyone out of some money or keep them distracted long enough so someone else can do the job. This nefarious, kinda sleazy reputation stayed with magic performers for centuries. But the oldest trick in the book, or at least in the Westcar Papyrus, involves tearing a goose's head off. Don't worry, no geese were harmed in the making of this papyrus, which dates to somewhere between 2000 and 1300 BCE and purportedly details events from centuries earlier. The illusion it describes actually relies on a prosthetic head and the ability to tuck a bird's actual noggin under its wing area. David Blaine and David Copperfield have each done a version of the trick. That idea of taking something old, sometimes very old, and making it new, points to another wonderful thing about magic. Its practitioners are nerds in the best sense of the word. As historian Nicholas Barker said in Mark Singer's incredible profile of the magician and actor Ricky Jay, Ricky would say you can't be a good conjurer without knowing the history of your profession because there are no new tricks under the sun only variations. Jay's recall of magic history was legendary, but any good illusionist is, on some level, a student of their craft. 
There's something beautiful about the idea of practicing the same trick by oneself for dozens of hours on end just to provide an audience a brief moment of delight. But magic resembling anything close to what the magical Davids do today didn't pop up until only a few centuries ago. One of the most important early accounts of magic was 1584's The Discovery of Witchcraft by Reginald Scott. It breaks down the decollation of John the Baptist illusion, which is reminiscent of the cut my lovely assistant in half trick of the 1900s. It involves cutting off a head and placing it upon a platter when in reality another dude is just sticking his head through a hole in the table. I would like to take this moment to apologize for breaking the number one rule of magic, never reveal how a trick is done. As an amateur historian, journalist, and most importantly, random dude on YouTube, I will always put facts first. But I understand the crime I have committed, and to the Brotherhood of Magicians, I await my punishment. Etymology time. If you look closely, the cover of that sexy expose, The Discovery of Witchcraft, use a very particular word, leisure domain. This word has basically completely fallen out of use, but for years, it was the way to refer to magic performers. Back in the 15th century, this phrase was first used to describe fast-fingered illusionists. It likely comes from Middle French and literally means light of hand. When it was adopted by the English, they smushed together the three words leisure de main into one and made it a noun. It was an alternative to a phrase that most of us are still familiar with today, sleight of hand. Sleight of hand, by the way, makes use of the word slight, which is actually derived from an old Norse word that means sly. Sly of hand, oh my god, that makes infinitely more sense. Now, before we continue on to the most recent few centuries of magic, I think it's important to stop and ask ourselves, why? Why perform magic? Why go see someone else perform magic? Maybe at some point people really believed that some sorcery was going on, and maybe for a while people used it as a means to make some sneaky money. But with today's presumably more informed audiences still paying good money to see magic shows, it does raise the question, what the heck is going on in our brains when we see magic being performed? Luckily, I was able to have a little chat with the guy who wrote the book on the psychology of magic. And I mean, like, literally. My name is Gustav Kuhn. I'm officially a reader um, in psychology, and I'm also the director of the Magic Lab at Goldsmiths University of London. How long have you been interested in the psychology of magic? Well, my personal journey started very early on. Um, I started started off become, being a magician where I used magic to entertain people. And even back then, I was always really interested in the psychological principles that magicians use to create their illusions. But there, the focus was very much on how can I learn about psychology to become a better magician? And it was only towards the end of my PhD that I realized this close link between formal psychology and magic. I started to use scientific methods to try and learn more about how magicians misdirect their audiences to learn more about the human brain. Why do humans like the spectacle of being fooled? Like, why do they why do they like to be deceived in a very spectacular way? I think we're generally drawn towards things that we don't understand, and there's an evolutionary advantage to this. So even young infants are captivated by events that don't make sense to them. And so possibly one reason is that it's due to these deep-rooted cognitive functions that attract us to magic. Um, but magic involves so many different things, theatre, fun, music, humour. Um, so there's loads of layers of entertainment that are thrown in through magic that we all find incredibly enjoyable. I never really thought about it in terms of like, yeah, babies experience magic every single day because they don't understand how any of it works. Yeah, for them, the whole everyday life is just magic. Um, and that's what we use in psychology. So one of the key principles to try and understand infant cognition is to see how interested are they in different events. Um, and they're reliably more interested in things that don't make sense to us. So it's possible that there is a direct link between magic uh, as adults um, to the way that we experience the world as babies. So let's talk about how our brains can go from incredibly complex, impressive organic computers to absolute baby mush as soon as an unexplainable magic trick is performed in front of us. It all has to do with cognitive errors. As the magician Teller wrote for Smithsonian Magazine, magicians have done controlled testing in human perception for thousands of years. Much of that testing has focused on the weak points and pitfalls of human perception and cognition. Perception is how we experience things from the stimulation of the senses. As Caroline Marone summarized the 2008 paper by Dr. Kuhn and his collaborators, errors in perception result in the production 
of illusions. This is pretty straightforward when it comes to what we generally call an optical illusion. Our sense of vision seems to betray us, showing us something that isn't really there. I should say, not every psychologist agrees that there is a distinction between perception and cognition. But if we think of the traditional definitions in which cognition is a higher order of thinking that involves perception, along with things like our existing knowledge and capability to draw inferences and conclusions, we can start to see how magicians prey on the blurry space between these two mental processes. One of the biggest tricks a magician uses is misdirection. Most people associate that word with the simple act of distracting the audience physically. I'm waving the wand with my right hand while my left is grabbing something from my pocket. But misdirection can take many forms, from conversational misdirection, known as patter, to forcing inattentional blindness, a phenomenon where people are completely oblivious to something happening in plain sight. It's not simply a matter of looking in the wrong place. Even in scientific studies involving eye trackers, where participants were confirmed to be looking at the area where the trick is happening, participants were often still duped. Adult or baby, psychologist or regular Joe, no brain is immune to the magician's use of misdirection. Our brains want things to be easily explained and they are, therefore, easily manipulated. In your research into the science of magic, what is the most surprising thing you've learned? I think the main thing is just how gullible we are and how easily we can be deceived. I think that for me has been the most phenomenal finding. I mean, we spent the last 20 years studying misdirection and the thing that I've been really astonished by is just how little of our environment we generally consciously aware of. Um, and then more recently, we've been looking at mind control and forcing techniques. And again, there's a forcing technique. These are principles that magicians use to covertly influence your decisions. And again, there, like with misdirection, it's just so easy to influence someone's decisions. And we're just oblivious to a lot of these influences. Let's move our story to the 18th century. One prominent figure was Isaac Fox, who was known as a sleight of hand man. Catchy. He would advertise his shows in local papers and amassed a pretty handsome fortune during his career. Fox, while successful, still represents how little the profession was respected at the time. His shows were panned by critic William Hogarth, who included Fox in those who debauched by fooleries the English stage. Fox was not disheartened by criticism. In fact, he would report in the newspaper himself when he would make a large deposit into the bank simply to brag about how successful he was. Good for you, sleight of hand man. And then, something interesting happened. Magic changed from slightly trashy entertainment to respected theater. Jean-Eugene Robert Houdin played a key part in this shift. If you're eyeballing this dude's name and thinking, that looks a little familiar, don't worry, this is not an illusion. Robert Houdin was the inspiration for the stage name of one Eric Wise, otherwise known as Harry Houdini. But we'll get to that dude in a minute. Let's talk about the French illusionist who is often credited as the father of modern theatrical illusion. Jean-Eugène Robert started off as a watchmaker in France, but his destiny lay elsewhere. He married Joseph Cécile Houdin, hyphenated his name, we love a 19th century illusionist not beholden to the prevailing gender norms of his day, and eventually opened his own theater in the Palais Royal. The venue was much swankier than most people were used to for stage magic. Robert Houdin is also noted for performing in a regular, classy evening suit, rather than exuberant robes or elaborate costumes that many magicians at that time would wear on stage. Robert Houdin's magic act was awesome. It incorporated meticulously rehearsed illusions, a little bit of mentalism, and notably, the use of electricity and robotic automatons that Robert Houdin had built himself. I guess those clock-making skills came in handy after all. Robert Houdin's magic was so well respected that he was even asked by the French government to go on a magical mission to Algeria. Coolest words I've ever said. In the newly colonized area, local religious leaders called marabouts were using magic of their own to impress and influence tribes. Robert Houdin's job was to go show that French magic was superior, and apparently, he succeeded. And then came Eric Wise, aka Harry Houdini. As an homage to his predecessor, he named himself Houdini. Houdini changed the game. We do not have enough time to cover his entire fascinating life, but here is a quick overview of this dude's wild, magical career. Eric, aka Eric, aka Harry, emigrated from Hungary and settled in Wisconsin with his rabbi father. Early on, he became a trapeze artist in a circus, Mazel Tov. 
He moves to New York in 1887 and eventually began performing in vaudeville shows. They were not very successful. Hang in there, Harry. Trapeze pun. In the early 1890s, he started performing magic, and by 1894, he became known for an escape act that started with him being tied up in a bag and locked in a trunk. His act would involve many forms of escapology, but the highlight was having the local police strip search Harry, lock him in shackles, and throw him in jail, only to have him escape. Audiences loved it. His most famous trick, the Chinese water torture cell, involved him being locked up, submerged, upside down in a tank full of water where he had to escape before drowning to death. That is my literal nightmare. Harry performed until his death in 1926, but he did more than just perform magic. He starred in a few movies, he was the president of the Society of American Magicians, and he even wrote a few books, including a scathing literary takedown of a magician whom he said suffered from supreme egotism. That supposedly big-headed magician was Robert Houdin. That's right, Harry turned on his childhood idol. Betrayal! Harry also had beef with anybody who practiced fortune telling, clairvoyance, or any sort of charlatan magic. He even went after Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, who was an avid believer in the spiritual arts. After Harry's death, he left behind a legacy of a new exciting kind of magic. Magic that pushed the envelope, that blurred the line between illusion and actual feats of impressive physical prowess. To this day, his name is firmly and permanently associated with stage magic in all its forms. Thanks, Harry. Sorry you died. The 20th century kicked off bright with Houdini and kept pumping out some amazing acts. But Houdini was not alone. Acts such as Howard Thurston, Harry Blackstone, and Harry Kellar wowed audiences with their mind-bending illusions and spectacles. Hell, I even have a Harry Kellar poster in my room. Magic was suddenly one of the top forms of live entertainment. Can you imagine living in 1900, crowding into a bustling theater, and watching a dude remove his own head? That's what life's all about. And while going to see a magic show is undeniably fun, while writing the script, I couldn't help but wonder about the flip side of magic, the person behind the trick. Is it fun to perform sleight of hand? Is it fun to make an illusion happen? Is it fun once you know how the trick is done? I've seen a lot of tricks through my time. Um, some tricks really bore me because it's always the same. But then especially if you go to a magic convention where you've got these brilliant magicians who are often performing for, uh, especially for magicians. Um, and there's illusions that really blow my mind. A lot of them to do with mentalism. Um, so this is all to do with mind reading and mind control. Uh, so magicians such as Darren Brown um, or Luke Jamay, he's one of my favorite magicians. And he just creates these truly astonishing mental illusions um, that are beautiful to watch, but even more amazing once you actually understand how they're done. I have lots of memories as a child reading these trick descriptions and then ordering the tricks that was still from a catalogue and then getting the trick sent home and you go, oh God, I can't believe that was so simple and be feeling really disappointed by that. But then you have other magicians where they will explain the multiple layers of deception and all of the details and the thinking that goes into creating some of these illusions. And some of it, if you just watch it without understanding how it's done, is completely missed on you. And so um, I think in those examples, the solution to a trick can actually be more beautiful than the trick itself. So I guess it is pretty fun to do magic. The problem is most people can't just up and become a magician overnight. I mean, especially before the internet, how does one even learn a magic trick? Find an enchanted frog in a mystical forest who whispers you the secrets of illusion? Probably not, but maybe. More likely, you'd go visit a local magic shop or order from a magic catalog. The title of oldest magic shop in the world is often credited to Mayette Magie Moderne in Paris, France. It originally opened in 1808, though according to some, it didn't really start selling magic tools until about 1830. Either way, this establishment is one of the first examples of a brick and mortar store dedicated to providing amateurs the tools and tricks to perform their own magic. Over the next two centuries, magic shops and magic clubs opened up around the world. Suddenly, it was a bit more accessible for you or me to learn how to do a simple trick. Magic, unfortunately, began to fall off in popularity a tad during the mid 20th century. Some notable performers who still made something of a mark include the Masculine family, John Neville Masculine was a prominent magician and inventor. He's a key figure behind the pay toilet, among other distinctions. But I want to talk about his grandson, Jasper. Jasper was an illusionist and performer around the time of World War II. He ended up enlisting in the Royal Engineers when war broke out, and he decided his role would be to use his illusionary skills to save democracy. He apparently trained in the camouflage division, which he described as boring because a lifetime of hiding things on the stage had taught him more about camouflage than rabbits and tigers will ever know. Weird brag? 
He claimed to have started the Magic Gang, which seems like a fake thing that he made up. Turns out, he probably made up a lot of things. According to Jasper, he was able to use his magic skills to win the war through the creation of decoy cities and by concealing the Suez Canal. According to basically everybody else, he didn't do much, if anything, that was all that useful. As the 21st century approached, the rise of television magicians and Vegas performers brought magic into the forefront of entertainment again. Magicians became household names. David Copperfield, Siegfried and Roy, Penn and Teller. These are celebrities who do magic. Art, theatricality, and technical skill all came together to make a multi-million dollar industry. Speaking of David Copperfield, let's talk about arguably his most famous trick, making the Statue of Liberty disappear. Copperfield was known for big, extravagant tricks with pretty on-the-nose metaphors. In the televised special featuring this illusion, for example, he said it was meant to represent how precious our liberty is and how easily it can be lost. I can show with magic how we take our freedom for granted. On a stage on Liberty Island, an audience sat before the statue. A curtain was raised, and when it came down, the Statue of Liberty was seemingly gone. A helicopter even flew around, shining lights on where it was meant to be. Turns out, the entire stage had secretly rotated during the transition so that the view of the statue was blocked. Magic. And then, thanks to the internet, magic was able to become stripped down and raw again. People like David Blaine were able to find a niche in doing personal close-up magic. Magic had found its way back to the streets, but with some of the respectability and panache of the Vegas generation. You can now watch someone explain a card trick online in five minutes, and suddenly, you can do the trick yourself. It's exciting, but it's also confusing. How do these different worlds of magic relate? Is this still even the same thing? The crux of magic is experiencing something you believe to be impossible. That's the essence of magic. And you can present that in very different ways. You can present that in a really serious way or in a funny way. You can, that impossible event can be David Copperfield making the Statue of Liberty disappear, or it can be your friend making a coin appear from behind your ears. What do you think the future of magic and illusion will look like? I mean, magic constantly has to adapt um, because as we grow up with new technology, new things become impossible. If you would have gone, if you could go back in time and you take a mobile phone a hundred years back in time, I mean, that would be true magic. I mean, that would be the most magical thing that you could experience. Um, as technology is advancing, more and more things become possible. And so one of the big challenges for magic is it, it has to be one step ahead of all of these technological advances. And so as such, Magic will constantly advance. How it changes, I have no idea. I'd have to be able to generally see the future to answer that question. I mean, that would be pretty magical if you could tell me exactly how it's <laughs> gonna change. <laughs> Whether or not he can predict the future, Gustav is right. Magic will keep evolving over time as the world, technology, and people change. Humans are always gonna be interested in watching the spectacle of someone performing an act that is supposed to be impossible. That feeling of magic will, I hope, never go away. It might not look the same as it did 2,000 years ago, but then again, I bet in 100 years, you could still go down to the street and find someone making a ball disappear from one cup and reappearing in another, maybe making a buck or two along the way. Thanks for watching The History of Fun. Let us know your favorite magician in the comments from David Copperfield to some guy your mom hired for your eighth birthday. Don't forget to wave your magic wand, shuffle the deck twice, and I'll see you next time.